thank you very much for having me. So um, as Sydney's men mentioned, I'm from the Curtin Institute for Computation. Some of you may have heard of us. Um, we're a group, well, I've got a slide for this, but we're a group in uh, Curtin University. And the idea is we want to help researchers with computation applying AI and machine learning. So, we're actually a virtual organisation. We're comprised of many researchers around Curtin University. Um, at the moment, we've got about 170-odd uh, researchers that are part of our institute. They all dedicate a portion of their time working on computational problems. And we try to be interdisciplinary. So we have, we initially started with a team of four people where we had one person looking after each faculty. Um, I personally look after health sciences because I've had some previous experience uh, doing machine learning and AI in health sciences. Um, but then my colleagues help look after the different faculties. And I'm sure many of you would recognize um, our director. So Andrew Rowell was the, um, pre I think the first executive director of IVEC and Pawsey. Um, but since then, he's moved on to other things such as, um, correct me if I'm wrong, by the way, I'm not sure. We also cover, I guess, five major research themes. Um, one is big data analytics. So that's uh, run by a professor um, from statistics. Um, we look at simulations as well, um, modeling and optimization from mathematics, visualization from humanities, um, and education as well from our Center for Learning and Teaching group. And so now we have a team of uh, about nine people that help uh, work on research projects. We also engage in industry projects as well. Um, so I'm first, so I have a background in computer science. Um, my colleague Rebecca is from astronomy, Shiv, as many of you have know Shiv. Um, Shiv's our HPC specialist in our team. He's um, got a background in electrical engineering and material science. Dan um, was also working at Pawsey, as many of you would know. His um, background is in remote, remote sensing and satellite imagery and physics. Uh, Kyra's in computational chemistry, like Andrew. Um, but we also have some new people joining our team. So we also have Ree from UWA. Uh, his background is in natural language processing in computer science. Uh, we have Roberta from Murdoch. Um, her work is in environmental engineering. She does a lot of work with water and some projects that we have recently in power. So I'm, I'm not sure many of you follow cryptocurrencies, um, but we have a project with Power Ledger and um, kind of power trading, I guess, um, in their projects. Uh, we have Richard that recently joined us. He was in Cambridge um, working in a startup um, from a computer science background as well. And we have Catherine from Murdoch, who's just joined us as well, who has a background in um, bioinformatics. So it's a big group of people, and it's still growing. Our kind of goal is to kind of help the researchers. So you see a lot of companies like Google and Facebook that have like data science teams where they go and touch upon every department in uh, the organization and they help them out. But what about researchers? You know, they have some really interesting problems as well, um, but they don't usually have the funding. So I kind of think that's kind of the spirit of um, why we exist, to help them and to help, you know, not necessarily improve ad revenue, but to help with other sciences and other things like that. We're also affiliated with the Innovation Center in Perth. So um, it was previously called the Cisco Internet of Everything Innovation Center, but it's really a partnership between four main parties. So that's us, Akern University, uh, Woodside Petroleum, and uh, Cisco, as well as Data61 and CSIRO. So this is quite an old picture of our building, but here you see our Vice Chancellor and the Premier um, at the time. So my talk's a little bit different. So I'm, I don't have a HPC background, but I guess what I kind of want to share with you is kind of the experiences I have in applying AI in research and also industry projects and how maybe from a supercomputing or a HPC point of view, how you can maybe we can work together or how you can best support us. But I will say some things that might challenge um, what you think about AI and um, HPC. So I'm sure many of you know about machine learning, you're at an AI conference, um, but how many of you have actually trained your own machine learning models and applied them to projects? Okay, there's a couple of you guys. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware that machine learning is everywhere in our daily lives. So from our Google search results, um, we get personalized um, you know, results in return from speech recognition for Siri or Google Assistant, uh, Netflix recommendations or other recommendation systems. Google Translate is now using an end-to-end deep neural network. Um, you can even see my news 
my personalised news here, it's of, um, I have interest in deep learning, so I have a deep learning article recommendation as well as cricket. Um, what, what I find really interesting is I'm not sure many of you have played with Google Photos, um, but just for fun, I thought I'll write, um, I'll search my collection of photos and just type scared, and it came up with this picture of me when I was a baby. So it's really interesting to see what the model's kind of doing. So perhaps it's learnt the concept of scared is something with a dark, ominous background with a face lit up in the front. So it's, it's so interesting um, trying to interpret some of these models sometimes. And then we see things a little bit further off in the future. So we have self-driving cars, um, we have being able to annotate like fashion clothing and things like that. So that's really useful for researchers as well when they're looking at like animals and they're trying to annotate, um, I guess, there was one project with alpacas where they're trying to identify things with their feet and their muzzles and other things like that. We also see a lot of stuff in surveillance. So I think this image is taken from um, a CCTV camera in Singapore where they're trying to like measure how often the, do the sidewalls get used and by what types of pedestrians. And then we have things like are people using their seat belts? Um, who's using the phone? And we have really cool stuff such as the AlphaGo um, model beating the best Go player that we have at the moment. And then we also have things in art. So we have neural style transfer where you know, we take a picture of Van Gogh's Starry Night, it learns the style, and a picture of us, or some of our team at the Pawsey Supercomputer, and it's learnt to you know, redraw it in that Van Gogh style. So um, I'll just go through this quickly, because I'm sure most of you know about machine learning, but uh, machine learning really works well when we have complex problems that we can't describe well as in rules. Um, what we've seen over, um, I guess, academia and partners of publications, we had this massive rise of expert systems. So expert systems are just rule-based systems. You go and speak to, let's say, a medical doctor, you, you figure out what kind of works in their field, and then you implement that as rules. But what we found for very complex problems, AI or you know, building a learning model was much better. So in terms of publications, you can see AI in the mid-90s has just skyrocketed uh, since then in terms of publications. And right now, if you do searches on archive, which is open source papers, if I just search AI and computer vision, I get about over 5,500 papers published last year. So there's no one person that can read all those papers. Um, if I search GitHub for just machine learning, so just one keyword, I get about you know, almost 91,000 repositories. So there's a lot of people um, and a lot of money being spent in this area. So why is, I guess, machine learning so interesting now? It's always been interesting to me, um, but traditionally our traditional algorithms could only do so much. Once we had a lot more data, it still couldn't really perform that well. But what we found out, and as we develop new kind of techniques in machine learning, um, if we build a neural network and we start making it slowly deeper, deeper, bigger and bigger, it could actually take advantage of that extra bit of data. So one thing I want to mention here is that in this little bit here where I say feature engineering, um, it's not that all algorithms perform the same. It's just whoever comes up with the best features usually wins, um, depending on the algorithm. And when we look at like a very famous benchmark um, data set called ImageNet. Uh, we see when we actually start using deep learning for the first time, when it was published, well not published, but it's a competition, so the first team to use deep learning, they were able to significantly improve the error rate on that data set. And now we're currently, so this only goes down to 2016, now we're, I'm not sure what level we're at, but we're, we're already beating human level performance. And as the, um, the previous speaker mentioned, so uh, the DGX1 type of deep learning supercomputer. So this sli these slides are you know, a few years old, but at the time they were retailed for that price in US dollars, um, as well as you know, Intel have been promoting the Xeon fee previously. And I really like this paper because the researchers um, in this area have no idea about deep learning or machine learning. So what they did is they took an off-the-shelf model and retrained it on their data set and they were able to increase the previous state of the art in their field, which was 15.6% accuracy, up to 60, without really the know-how. So that's kind of how, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's becoming more accessible to researchers and uh, industry people. All right, so hopefully that's enough with it about machine learning background. I just want to talk about some of the projects that we work on, and I guess 
my challenge to you is to think about how you could best support these kind of projects in terms of our workflow in developing AI models or um, other things like that, maybe when we productionize the models. So this is a project we did with uh, Kyra. Um, I believe we actually refer to them as ICRA, but the Curtain Branch. I'm not sure about the branding, um, as well as the Desert Fireball Network. So the idea is they have all these cameras kind of in the Australian desert and not in the desert in some places, and they just watch the sky. And they want to detect rare events, which are these meteors, which they call fireballs. So we're given a data set in 2015, only taken from two cameras. One was a camera that you know, they drove around, so it was a mobile camera on the back of a ute. Uh, the other one was actually a stationary camera. And out of all those images, they detected about uh, 70 uh, meteors, which is not much for training a model. So we took a few approaches to this. We'd, I don't like to jump into machine learning just because of the sake of it. Um, so we took some more standard computer vision techniques. We just tried detecting lines, we tried removing the, the stars or the galaxies in the background. Uh, we weren't able to build a very good model. It might work for a few images, but not others. Um, the, res the research group had already tried a neural network, but it had generated so many false positives. So as I mentioned previously with uh, medical research where they just took an off-the-shelf model and retrained it on their data, we just tried that for fun. So we'll use this um, ImageNet or Google Inception version 3 model. It's got about 20 million parameters that it learns. And so we just retrained the last layer for our problem. And we got about 80%, which wasn't really good enough. So what we did is we built our own model. So it's much smaller. It's what I would call a three-layer convolutional neural network. It's got a much smaller amount of complexity. You can see by based on the parameters, and we were able to get 100%. Okay. Yep. Uh, this one? Yeah, so it's a good question, because I kind of trained it for too long. <laughs> so I think if I was to do it again, maybe like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But the punchline for this of why it worked is actually in the next slide. So we only had 70 meteors, so that's not really much to train a model with. So what we did is we created our own data set of meteors. So we took, <laughs> we took the images that had no meteors in them, and we took random patches, and we started drawing lines. So what we did is we created a data set of 50% that had nothing, and 50% that had our drawn meteors. And we varied the lines. We ch you know, changed the background, we changed the length and the width of the, the fireball, and the brightness. We had to do some tuning because we didn't expect, um, sometimes we get like a bright patch of the sky and our meteor will actually be darker than that sky. So we had to do some adaptive kind of bright, brightness, um, I guess, filtering or pre-processing. And then we did some other things. So color wasn't that important. So this is kind of our experiments. So the color of the number represents how bright I'm making the meteors. Uh, compared to the background. So first we just made it very easy for it, we made it really bright. So it was detecting it very easily. But then it was only detecting bright meteors. So then we slowly and slowly made it fainter and fainter. So you can see it's starting to detect more. The reason why I can't report on other things such as recall is because we actually don't know if the researchers found all the meteors, which they didn't. So that's why I can only report what we predict. Oops, sorry. Um, but then we went too faint. So number four, we're like, hey, we, our, our accuracy dropped a fair bit. Um, and then number five, we brought it back up as well as we added our adaptive brightness and then we were able to get 100% 100, 100 precision. So that's one of the projects. Um, I guess from a HPC point of view, we were able to train this quite easily, as you mentioned, so even on a desktop machine. But I guess when we want to productionize it, then we might consider HPC or the researchers can put it out. Because what happens is they actually have, um, I think they have processing power on the actual cameras, on the sites where they install it. So they want to do a very coarse filtering, remove all the images that have nothing, and then um, someone goes out and actually collects the data and drives back um, to the office. All right, so another project that we've done is actually looking at sensor data. So wearable sensors have become a very popular thing um, with Fitbits and things like that. But then in sports and physio, they're interested in not just walking or you know um, number of active hours, but actually the specific movements. So one of the projects we did with the WA um, Academy of Performing Arts was actually looking at ballet dancers and how they train. And the idea is um, they have a more realistic log of their activity 
at the moment they're just writing like, oh, today I did 50 jumps. Um, but that's, there's no quantitative type of reason for that. It's just what they think they did. Um, but the hope is to actually measure load and to reduce the risk of injury. So I have a little video. It should come up soon. But basically, they have six sensors um, attached to the dancers. They have it on the shins, both the shins, both the thighs, and two at the back. And the idea is we want to classify their movement. I don't know if that's clear enough, but I've just shown one sensor, which is the right shin, and I'm showing the, X, the accelerometer and the X, Y, and Z directions. So what's actually mentioned at the bottom is actually the annotations that the uh, sports and physio researchers have actually noted. But that's the kind of idea. So just imagine those three kind of sensors, but there's, um, I mean, there's 54 of them, and we have to try, use all that data and figure out what they're doing. And we can't use video because that, was, that would have been much easier, but we're not allowed to. So in terms of data sets, It's actually not that massive, I guess, to what you're traditionally used to. Uh, it's about 106 gigabytes, and a lot of that is actually not necessary for us to do training. Um, they're also interested in doing different types of categories, such as uh, the category one is just a jump and a leg lift, but then category two would be the directional, and category three will be a specific ballet type of movement. And look, with cleaning, we reduce the data set size for each dancer quite dramatically. And this is kind of the resulting model. So you take all this kind of sensor data, and then the yellow is kind of what our model predicts. So I haven't generated a video to show you, unfortunately. Um, and we get a pretty decent score, 87. Um, we actually get 99% if I include only the movements of interest. But when I, I want, what I want to do is include transitions. So I might not be doing a leg lift. I might just be like stretching. But you know, I still want to, because um, that's a real world type of uh, situation, I still want the model to get that, to judge the model wrongly for that. Um, but here we see the actual number of parameters in the model is actually getting smaller. So this is only a two layer convolutional network. I didn't have to take an off the shelf type of thing. So this is another project we did with um, biomedical researchers. So the idea is that they design drugs and they give the drugs to the mice. And then after, afterwards, they want to measure, are there any potential side effects? The main focus of interest is actually designing drugs to treat Alzheimer's or other cognitive decline diseases. So this is an image of a brain scan that's been dyed. Um, well, they've, they've dyed the, the sample, and then they've taken a scan of it. So it's actually not a big data set as well. Um, we kind of have all these images, so they look like that. And then they have these masks. So these masks are like um, manually generated by the researchers. It's, it's, very, it's a very manual and intensive process. Um, you actually need an expert to do it. So you need someone like doing his PhD or a postdoc who knows about what to actually segment out. And it's very time consuming. So they would design all these drugs, run these experiments, and then they'll spend a month or two just cutting out images, which is very boring. So what we did is we, we thought, hey, can we tra train the machine learning model to do that for them? So the first task that they kind of gave me was, hey, can I take this image? Can you generate this mask for me? And I'm like, why do you need the mask? So they reply, we need the mask to measure the leakage. So I'm like, hey, how about you tell me the leakage? And then I'll actually just measure it directly. So by doing it that way, so this is a harder problem to generate these masks. Um, were able to get a really good result. And interestingly, I don't know if you can see it clearly, you can't. So with this image, it's actually one of the filters in our model, and I've visualized it. It's actually learned to, to, cut it, to generate the mask by itself without me telling it to. So for it to do a good job to measure leakage, it had to learn to segment, if that makes sense. But I don't tell it to explicitly segment. And the way they kind of measure the performance of these models is in correlation. Um, don't ask me why. Uh, but yeah, so there's differences between the different researchers. Uh, one person might annotate in a certain way, another might in another. So our experiment was to train on one person, test on him, 
and then also get a, another p researcher and see if we can get a similar type of measurement. And here we can see it's an actually 80% correlation for the different researcher. Um, but that's okay, because they said there's no standard in their field. This is something they want to push towards, like a more objective way of measuring. And this is such a small model now. I'm looking at 11,000 parameters. So I don't, you don't need a supercomputer. You, on my laptop, it's more than sufficient to kind of do this. So we've done other projects with, um, on NASA data, so with our, our you know, School of Earth and Planetary Sciences, or so our geology department. So they have all these images taken of Mars, and they want to count craters. The reason why they want to count craters is because it helps them with their models for estimating the surface of um, the age of the surface, sorry. So there is a data set out there. There is <laughs> there's somebody called Robbins. He's annotated 384,000 um, craters. And it's not just this is a crater or not. There's actually detailed annotations, <laughs> which is a, a massive effort. Uh, the images are quite large. So you can see um, the kind of dimensions. And each pixel is about 100 meters. They're really interested in sub-kilometer craters because at the moment um, it's quite easy for me to identify this big one, but for the really small ones it just becomes intractable almost to manually count it. Um, and what's really cool about this, so what we had to do, we had to break it up because we couldn't feed it into our GPU. So I didn't train this on Pawsey, uh, but we just split it up and then we stitched the image back together. So what's really cool is that at Curtin we have this facility called the Hive. It's just a visualization type of area and we have these massive screens. So it's about 24 million pixel tile displays. And so we could actually stand up on the display and you could actually walk up and see like a really small crater, which is really cool. So Andrew took this picture of us with the research team kind of looking at our results and visualizing it. So we've done some other projects as well. So we've looked at natural language processing. So it's really interesting working with humanities researchers. I'm not sure how many of you had the chance, but they think a bit differently to us, which is a good thing. Um, so we can do really cool stuff, like we can detect cars, we can detect people and things like that. That's out there, but they, they ask why. What does it mean that there's a car and there's a person there? What's the relationship? And I'm like, oh, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, that's what's important. I'm like, okay. Um, so one of the projects uh, we worked with a group in humanities was actually looking at um, extreme, violent extremist communications. So those are actually terrorist magazines and things like that. And they wanted to know, understand the methods of how they're portraying their propaganda, uh, recruitment and other things like that. So we applied a lot of natural language processing, computer vision techniques. Um, what we found, it wasn't up to what the social scientists wanted. So they cared about um, if, let's say, someone reused an image from the magazine, but they changed it to be resisting terrorism. Um, they realized that some of those people are actually inadvertently supporting it because they're using like a positively coded image. It could be people like cheering and they're saying, oh, I, and, or calling the, uh, the group like the ISIS government. So that's like legitimizing their group, that kind of stuff. So it's a very interesting, very difficult project. We've done stuff with Wi-Fi data, some more like log-based data. We want to you know, better manage our classrooms at Curtin. Um, that's a difficult project in itself as well, because like in this room, I'm sure many of you have multiple devices. Um, how do I only count you once or multiple times? What if you don't connect? What if you, you know, spoof your MAC address? So I see multiple kind of devices. Uh, we've also done some stuff with the Innovation Center. So this was an oil and gas company. So I'll just play um, some sounds for you, but basically the idea is we want to detect faults. These things are called fin fans and they cool the oil and gas plant. They fail over time. When enough of them fail, that can cause a very, they can cause downtime in the plant and that can cost you know, millions of dollars. So I just, maybe before that, I'll just mention that they tried a whole bunch of different sensors. They tried vibration sensors, they tried acoustic sensors and I can't remember the others, uh, they found acoustic was the best. So that's kind of the recommendation going forward. So I just played these sounds for you. They're not very interesting, but... Sorry, the internet's just a little bit slow, so what I'll do is I'll play it here. So that's a fan with no fault. That's a fan with bearing fault. <laughs> and
and that's a fan with a corrosion fault. So I'm not sure if you could tell the differences, I can't. <laughs> but the model can, which is pretty cool. <laughs> you just replace the whole thing. <laughs> so we tried a whole bunch of things. So traditionally with signal, digital signal processing, you know, you can try Fourier transforms and a whole bunch of other things like that. Um, there was a requirement, an engineering requirement, where we needed a device to be on the plant, which is pretty remote, um, and we need it to last, like the battery to last a year or two. Um, we also use a wireless network called LoRa, which is low powered, you know, long range type of network. Um, but we had kind of these restrictions. We had to build a really small model um, that was good enough to kind of detect these faults because we don't want to, someone to drive out there and keep replacing these batteries uh, very often. And very similarly, the same idea is looking at um, being done as an internship project in the center, which is looking at escalators. So if you drop like a sharp object in an escalator, it will actually sharpen, not even a sharp object, I think any object um, of reasonable, like, I don't know, strength. <laughs> it will actually sharpen the edges, so the actual escalator has to be shut down. Um, so what they're trying to do is have better ways of detecting that early so they can shut down before injuries occur. But using very similar ideas. So this project, um, was a project done by Shiv, as some of you may know. This is very interesting. So Shiv actually came up with something new. So the goal was to actually segment a map of Joondalup, so in terms of housing uh, and buildings and things like that, but Shiv didn't have data. So segmentation, as some of you may know, it's kind of like a pixel level labels, that, that block within an image or that polygon is of a certain class or category. So what he did very cleverly is, he got um, the researchers to classify, um, I guess, little snippets of, like, crops of the image and just say, hey, that this is, like, of rural, this is of, um, I think, rural and urban or some other kind of categories. Uh, and then he trained a classifier. So that's a much simpler problem. But what he did next is he actually took what the filters that were learnt from his model and he actually applied it to the segmentation problem. Now, how he applied it is, I don't quite understand it, but he uses some ideas in quantum chemistry. It's called the linear combination of atomic orbitals. So I'm not a quantum chemist, but um, he kind of had to do a more manual approach in combining these weights. And he was able to generate these really nice maps. So you can see here, just from that kind of easy way, like very practical way of collecting data to generating these kind of difficult segment segmented ma maps. I believe they're working with Landgate on a project to implement this for you know, some of their satellite imagery. Um, apparently he's writing a paper, so if you're interested in that, I'll, I haven't read it yet, so it's all good. And some other, another project we did with Pawsey, so the Pawsey Internship Program, um, there was a student which Shiv uh, supervised, and it's with working with some researchers from our ecology department at Curtin. So they're interested in kind of the, the movements of our wildlife uh, through certain regions. Uh, they actually asked for a really difficult problem. They want to identify this, let's say, kangaroo, but they want to know if the same kangaroo comes back, like tomorrow. So we, you know, we have facial recognition and stuff for humans, <laughs> but you want something like for animals. So uh, we do have some ideas on how to do that, but as a first kind of phase, we looked at can we you know, classify them first and can we count them? And that's still useful data that they don't have to go through and look through all the videos um, or images themselves. So I guess that's kind of it. With, with this project, uh, Shiv actually ran this on Athena. So that's a GPU cluster uh, Pawsey uh, provided. Um, and what was really nice about that, he could feed the whole map of Joondalup in. So he didn't have to deal with tiling and then trying to you know, connect things back together, which also would have been nice for this project as well. But I didn't have access to Athena at the time. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. So hopefully you found it interesting. If you have any questions, then. Feel free to ask them. Thanks, everyone.